panel and I are kind of shifting gears a little bit and trying to address implementation rather than you know, more discussion about process and theory and, and what have you. And uh, joining me today uh, is Duncan Challen, uh, Executive Director for Industry Development, Department of Industry, so we have an industry perspective. Uh, Dean Willemson, CEO, DNW Group, private developer. And last night at dinner, you just can't wait to invest, right? That's right. Okay. <laughs> And Eric Caraga, who you may have heard earlier if you uh, were part of the morning sessions, Executive Director, Denver Office of Economic Development. What we'd like to do, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes uh, giving you a kind of partial case study of Ekurulani, which is near Johannesburg, which was mentioned this morning as a, you know, has some relevancy being near Johannesburg. Uh, two cities, two airports, uh, an airport that was built out in uh, rural lands. Um, what can we learn from that? And I just picked out a couple of uh, key points that I think we'd like to focus on, or help ourselves focus on. Uh, one being that uh, a master plan for the Aerotropolis, and again, uh, the Aerotropolis in our definition is as broadly as you can think of it. It's all of Western Sydney. It's not just right around the airport. Penrith on the north, Liverpool, Badgerys Creek, Camden, uh, Campbelltown on the south. That's the kind of scope we're thinking of. Uh, it needs to be crafted by the community. And I know here in Australia that you have very robust uh, stakeholder engagement I, uh, sessions. I was just in the one for Westmead uh, Medical District uh, about a month ago and 90 people came. <laughs> it was really very interesting. The same should happen with the Aerotropolis and not be partially planned but planned and crafted by the community. The master plan needs to have three things going on at the same time. A socioeconomic focus, designing a plan that will deliver the benefits that we've heard all about in uh, the various studies. The benefits of jobs, uh, GNP, productivity, etc. And land use, of course, very important key to this. And a very important focus on implementation from day one. So we're going to, as I said, shift our focus a little today in the uh, this panel session and try to focus on implementation. What's next for Western Sydney? One of the things that was interesting about the South African Aerotropolis was positioning districts for competitive advantage. And I think the Tri-City report that just came out I had a chance to review all 240 pages over the last couple of days. I think talks about the need for different places in the region to have a focus and to be competitively positioned. So not competing city to city, but as a region being a competitive area on the world stage. The Aerotropolis region then uh, is vast and it means that there will be some areas, uh, and I'll go back to the Tri-City report for a moment, some areas that focus on education, other on high technology, others on innovation districts, or just, play, uh, just plain a lovely place to live, work, play, and learn. I think those are all the things that one can aspire to in this region. But it takes work. You can't assume that just because the airport's coming that this will happen. It has to be planned now. I know you're all underway, but it needs to be planned now so that when the airport is done, the Aerotropolis has already started to develop, if not fully developed. And that needs uh, an integrated master plan. So not only socioeconomic benefits delivery as kind of the basis, uh, but physical planning of all sorts, including that enabling infrastructure that we're all talking about as well as other layers of development, including the environment and uh, the focus on quality of life. And so realizing the vision for this area, 
uh, needs to focus, again, on the benefits. And one way to do that is to identify early catalytic projects that could be done right away. And, and we heard about some of them this morning that are uh, starting the science and technology park near the airport, for example. Uh, the work with the agri agribusness and uh, getting a food to market. Uh, those things are catalytic projects that are going to help move along the larger aerotropolis. But there needs to be coordination. It can't be done piecemeal. And so I assume that there is a structure in place for that to happen. But let's now um, turn to our panel and starting first with Duncan from an industry perspective. How do we make the Aerotropolis a reality? What needs to happen next? Great. Um, thanks very much. I think we've been talking a lot about how big this opportunity is. But I think one thing we all have to be very mindful of is that when we talk about a greenfield site, and I'm in particular talking about the Aerotropolis, and if I drill down to another level, I'd like to maybe talk about to make this a bit more practical, around the aerospace and defense industries precinct that we're looking to establish adjacent to the Western Sydney Airport. I think what's important to remember is that almost 65, maybe even 70% of all greenfield precincts fail. So for us just to say we'll build it and they will come, that, that, that's not going to happen. We have to be very mindful of the fact that we have to get the value proposition right for that precinct for it to be successful. And if we don't, if we don't have enough reasons for industry to want to be in that precinct, those precincts are going to fail. So I think it goes back to a lot of the points that have been mentioned this morning and also uh, that what you mentioned today. It's really about the live, work, play aspect of that aerospace and defense precinct. We've got great capability here in Western Sydney, in particular advanced manufacturing, med tech, the real high end, you know, high value types of jobs. But if we build a precinct just based on that, it's going to fail. So we really have to make sure that we can embed universities, we can embed STEAM, we can embed vets, we can embed research and development, and then we can attract the big anchor tenants, so Northrop Grumman, so Ian's here today, is a great indication of if we get the right ingredients together, this can be a very successful proposition. What we want to do also to make sure is that in Western Sydney, it's such a really diverse multicultural area. We have to make sure that we also give it some of the creative industry's heart to it as well. So when people look to work somewhere, they've got to make sure that they do have the live, work, play attributes, and that it needs to be connected. So what are we doing at the Department of Industry? Well, we're talking with industries like the Northrop Grumman to understand what is it that you need from this precinct? What are the types of skills that you will need for your workforce now and also going into the future? What are the attributes of a functioning precinct in terms of that live, work, play, that you will need to enable you to attract the people that you need for your business. So what we really need to do is have more of these forums. We need to have more of these opportunities where we can talk with industry, where we can also talk with local communities around what are your expectations for that precinct. Our view is we want it to, to be a precinct that will generate those highly skilled, highly paid jobs that leverages on the opportunities in particular around the defense industry. So most of you will know the federal governments are spending up to $195 billion worth of expenditure into defence projects. Not all of that will be obviously in, uh, in New South Wales or in, in Western Sydney. But there's a huge opportunity for New South Wales businesses to maximise that defence spend. So our role is to now take something that was a concept, which was, yep, we've got a Western Sydney city deal that's coming. We've got an idea on how big the precinct should be. We know that we want to attract universities. We know that we want to attract... Uh, make sure we get the right VET uh, curriculums in place. We want to get research and development. And we really need to make sure that we can get big companies like the Northrops working with the smaller SMEs that are part of their supply chain. And you know, what we're going to be doing in, as an example in supporting Northrop is we're going to pull together a working group that's focusing on how do we support Northrop, make sure that their $50 million investments will return the things that they need to. So we're working with their teams to understand what are their sustainability commitments. We're working with their team to understand what are the skills that you'll be looking for. We'll be working with his team to understand what type of universities in particular 
and what type of curriculums do they need to offer so that we can make sure that we get the right skills going through um, their, their facility. We also want to make sure we can do that with other industries as, as well. So we're going to look to establish, and it's work in progress, a Western Sydney Investment Attraction Office. It'll be within the Department of Industry, but it'll be a partnership with the Commonwealth Government. It'll be a partnership with the local councils in that area as well. And its mandate is going to be to look to, A, promote the opportunities of that defence industries, uh, aerospace and defence industries precinct, and also look to attract both local and international investment into that precinct. We're looking to base it in Liverpool as well. So these are the things that we can really demonstrate that the New South Wales government is being very proactive in taking a lead in partnership with the federal government and local councils. I think for us, we need to make sure that we don't duplicate what's already going on. So I know a lot of the councils are already doing great stuff in terms of the investment attractions that they do. So we want to avoid the duplication and we want to make sure that we can add value. So I think those are some of the, the, the primary things that we'll be looking at. And we are also will be organising, as the Premier mentioned this morning, a, the, the Premier's Aerotropolis Summit 2026, which will be next year. And that's also an opportunity to bring together the key international investors, local players, property owners and industry to start to really talk about how do we make this concept real. Because it's a, a magnificent opportunity, but as I said, most greenfield precincts do fail. So if we get it wrong, and we get the planning wrong, and we don't have a, master, a comprehensive master plan like you mentioned, you know, in 10 years' time, we're going to look back and go, how do we get that so wrong? And that's what I really want to avoid, that we don't get it wrong, because we've got such a great opportunity right here, right now. Excellent. I think it's, it's great that you mentioned uh, the mix of uses. So it's not that it's an isol uh, a set of places that are isolated and single use that in order to make a science park really work, you need to be able to live nearby, uh, enjoy uh, meeting with friends, et cetera. And so we, ha we have to work on that because sometimes in planning, it ends up that you have this sort of segregation and that's, that's not Sydney among other things and it's not really going to succeed in the long haul. Can I just, uh, just, just put some clarity to Because when we start talking about aerospace and defense industries as a precinct in terms of its uh, definition, that's just the starting point in terms of that precinct. That's where we see that we'll focus our attention in the beginning. But it really is about high tech types of industries. It doesn't have to be defense or defense industries. We also like to target, you know, in terms of cyber security, uh, software integration, systems integration, electronics, you name it. Because what we're seeing in the industry is that the very vertical sectors are not very horizontal. So when you talk about one traditional sector, it cuts across everything. So we really do want to have a look at multiple types of industries within that precinct. And then we, we, you heard this morning about the um, science technology part. We don't want to duplicate or compete against what they're doing. We want to make sure that we can uplift and actually complement each other. We also want to make sure that we don't compete against the other aerospace precincts around Australia. So you've got the Canberra and Brisbane and Melbourne. So there will be natural elements of where there will be some competition, but we want to make sure that we have our own niche offering and that it actually complements the other aerospace precincts around Australia. It's that Team Australia approach. Because we're not competing against each other in states, we're competing against the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And we have to be globally competitive to succeed and we have to work very closely together. So. You know, it is part of our mandate to, to really work very closely with the other state governments, with the Commonwealth government and local councils so that we compete on a global scale. Wonderful. Dean, as the developer who's Thank you. eager to invest with high investor sentiment. We are. Um, I was just <laughs> reflecting on that and uh, that's, that's a great overview and potentially took half of my points I was going to make. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just thinking about uh, reflecting on Canberra as, as an example of maybe a city that was um, had some planning undertook, there was a bit of a need uh, for some investment to happen. <clears throat> and maybe in our own thoughts, just reflecting on what we think about Canberra, um, what we think about it, uh, where it is today, and the journey it's been on, and what lessons maybe we could take um, when we apply the lens um, towards Western Sydney. Um, with some similarities in a sense, um, but also there's a, there's a very diverse, um, I suppose, set of drivers around it. Um, as far as thinking fr from our end, and as we uh, represent a number of businesses, um, one of which uh, we focus on providing the homes for the 28,000 um, potential new, new uh, employment uh, that will be created by the Aerotropolis. And I think a, an important part of that, which is quite a challenge by the nature of the fragmented 
land that we deal with uh, across Western Sydney um, in our development work uh, is um, creating quality, quality accommodation. So we're looking at talking about high quality jobs that are going to basically compete with CBD jobs. Um, if we haven't got high quality places to, to live and to, to love and to, to play in, um, then I question you know, how, you know, how we'll actually go about you know, creating that sort of, that sort of semi, um, not utopian sort of ideal, but I think there's some, there's some real work to be done there and potentially the, um, you know, the, I suppose, part of the work of the, the, the Western Sydney Corporation, uh, as well as thinking about how do, how do we all unite behind a common vision, uh, uh, sort of reflecting our time in business, and uh, everyone, I suppose, it's fair to say that without, without a clear understanding of what a vision in, is within a business, it's fair to say that the business uh, won't succeed. Um, can we take that same view when we're looking at the Western Sydney Airport region? Uh, what is the clear vision? And potentially, we've heard a lot, of, a lot of different ideas about what success could look like today, and I'm sure there'll be many more to come. Um, do we all have a piercing, you know, similar view of what that lighthouse looks like? Um, and maybe that's a place to start to make sure we're all, we're all shooting for the same star. So, um, if there is a comprehensive master plan for the full Aerotropolis, will that give you as a developer greater confidence in investing in this area? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we're around for the next 40 years, so we're very much, uh, I suppose we're here to, uh, and, and our products will be around for a lot longer, so we're very much in it for, for the long, long run, and I'd argue for the right reasons. Uh, I think the challenge will be is taking everyone else in our industry on that, on that same journey of um, committing to uh, delivering those outcomes that are for, the, for the best for the end user, for our customer. And uh, since residential, I, I gather, is a primary um, yep. occupation providing it, um, so it's affordable housing, but maybe a range or choice of housing, uh, especially around transit, if any. Um, are those, uh, you know, are you thinking about that as a, a way of positioning yourself? I mean, you're in competition with other developers. Is, are you thinking about that as a competitive advantage? Absolutely. I think similar, you um, sort of reflected on when we talk about master planning, talking about different asset classes need to be considered within the same, uh, in, in the same stroke of the brush. I think looking at different affordability and accessibility issues uh, when it comes to how we live is, is front of mind. So for example, in, in our world, we're, we're fortunate enough to be a part of some peak industry groups work on uh, affordable housing. And I think in, internally, we've got the flexibility uh, and the willpower to be innovative in looking at how do we do something about it ourselves. And we're not sort of gonna sit back and wait for government to solve the problem or wait for an industry group. We, we love being a part of it, but we also recognise that um, we're in it, uh, our purpose is around ultimately providing quality housing for all Australians of all walks of life um, and all abilities and all, 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 I suppose, affordability levels. Right, and mobility counts. Uh, ability to live where you can afford and get to your job is really critical. Um, we were talking earlier about zoning. You know, zoning can be stifling. Zoning can, can help the situation. Uh, Chicago, my professional hometown, I was involved in the zoning reform. And I tried to get rid of the requirement for cars. <laughs> I did not succeed. But <laughs> um, around transit, around mass transit and for affordable housing, we were able to reduce the requirement because if there's transit, you don't need to own a car and spend so much uh, on, on your family budget. Um, are you thinking a lot, you know, how to connect up of people that may need to be transit dependent? Yep. Uh, this is obviously, I'm sure we've all experienced a lot of great, a great examples around the world, and I think a lot, of, a lot of this conference is sort of preaching to the converted. We're here because we care about our, our local community and we want to see it thrive. Our experience, whether it's in Verbon in, in Germany, where you know, it's a, quite a great example of you know, a social, a really social focused community where, where it really thrives off the back of a light rail system. Um, and then looking at some examples throughout you know, maybe Japan, where um, yeah, it's very much centered around the rail all over into sort of South America, where there's rapid bus right. transport right. is brought in, where for us, you know, given the tyranny of distance that we face, um, yeah, the sort of the fixed rail is, is quite a, maybe not the best option, so definitely being open-minded. Yeah, we're a part of the, the Southwest Light Rail Corridor um, work at the moment, so things like that we're, we're very interested in. Wonderful. Yeah. Eric. Yes. Okay, so uh, in regards to building an aerotropolis and lessons learned from uh, the Denver side of things, 
Uh, obviously, the number one mission uh, that I think that all airports should have and is a great opportunity for a greenfield uh, new airport like Western Sydney is to protect the core aviation mission, obviously. It almost doesn't need to be said, but uh, obviously uh, the encroachment uh, upon residential and, and working with the local communities to, to control that, uh, that is the, the core mission of an airport, is to maintain the capacity of the, the airfield and the future runways. Uh, I think our experience um, is that as an airport that was built in 1989 and completed in 95, we did not have this concept as, of an aerotropolis or airport city back then. We knew we had to control residential. We were able to do that with intergovernmental agreements. But now we're in a situation where we are actively working with the communities surrounding us and strategically trying to come up with this notion of a master plan. So we're just trying to catch up now. But I think it's a tremendous opportunity as a new airport uh, coming in and using that negotiating leverage. And uh, Duncan alluded to the fact that um, creating industries that complement each other but do not compete, that's the struggle we're in. Uh, we're in a situation where we are the bigger, biggest city in, in the metro area, and we're trying to work with our partners to say, hey, we all benefit in this. Uh, we anticipate the creation of 70,000 jobs, and um, there's this reluctance right now where the other communities are saying, you're not going to tell us how to zone, you're not going to tell us how to plan, and we're trying to show the benefit. I think we're getting over that hump now. And so in terms of airport city, that's land we control on airport. We're moving forward with our land use plan now. But as we look at the broader region and the aerotropolis, that, that's kind of the debate at the table right now as to who gets to concentrate on aerospace, versus biosciences and health, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's kind of the stage uh, that we're in right now. And I think uh, as a new airport, you have an opportunity to define those roles in the beginning and not have conflict later. Um, describe a little this, uh, the stakeholder engagement process exactly. Mm -hmm. How are you undertaking that given mm -hmm. that it sounds like there yes. are a lot of conflicts to resolve. So it was very political. So we actually had to go to a vote of, of both communities to uh, agree to share uh, taxation uh, within our airport city, Aerotropolis region. Uh, that uh, created uh, basically an authority of equal members from, I'd say, seven or eight different jurisdictions on one side and then versus Denver. So we're all at the table right now. Uh, we are working with our Aerotropolis uh, consultants. So we have an airport city plan that's uh, a land use plan that's been set, and now we're trying to expand that into the broader region. And uh, it's not very easy. No, it takes a lot of patience. Um, well, so you were mentioning uh, sharing in taxation, et cetera, mm -hmm. and you just mentioned the Aerotropolis consultants. Mm -hmm. is, so there isn't an, another entity uh, that's acting as a master developer, or, or um, it would think? be, I guess, an intergovernmental uh, group okay. uh, between all the regional stakeholders. So we're talking several counties and several cities surrounding the airport, and uh, we're just getting to the table, trying to uh, really focus on our inventory, looking at our strengths in terms of industry clusters, looking at our available inventory, and we're just really in the, in the, the beginning stages in, in resetting our, our aerotropolis plan. Uh, in some ways, you're fortunate because the airport's already there, mm -hmm. and everything that people feared has happened, mm -hmm. or everything that they hoped for mm -hmm. is happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's not the same as here, where it's still a little bit of an unknown. You know, the impact when it actually starts operation is mm -hmm. going to be, you know, a shock probably to to many. Yes, but I think I take that as a, a opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still plenty of time. So good, 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 good. Um, the I think we we did talk. I mean, some, there was a little bit of discussion earlier about this notion of a master developer. I don't know. Do you want to comment on how you think that might work? I mean, maybe the region is too big, so let's assume it's not the entire West Sydney region, but you know, regions or 
just the air city, the, the air, uh, the vicinity around the airport. What would you think about that? So from a, from a government perspective, we realize that if you try to do this piecemeal, it becomes a bit like you know, Frankenstein where things just don't really look as, as good as they should be. So it, it is fundamental that you get the master plan right. So uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting opportunity where you've got the, the Western Sydney Airport Corporation, which is really whatever's in the fence is the Commonwealth government. And what's outside the fence really is state government or, or private ownership. So, there has to be a real level of coordination around how we work together with the stuff that's in the fence and then how do we start to develop the things that are outside the fence. And I, I think for us one of the challenges for the Western Sydney area is that a lot of the land is not really owned by government, right? So we have got a lot of landowners that have big parcels of land. So this is really an opportunity we've got to make sure that we can partner well with those landowners and make sure that together we can both capture value on the properties that they have. And I think the risk for government is that, because sometimes government go, moves a little bit slower than the private sector, right? And property developers may actually get ahead of us if we don't try and keep up as fast as we can. So the, the, the planning and the zoning, it's fundamental for us in terms of making sure that we have some entity that, that's able to coordinate across government. And for the success of this aerotropolis, it really is about the connectivity. So you know, we've got transport for New South Wales, which are fundamental for this. Then we've got the councils and you know, state government, industry development. We need to make sure that it, it's all coordinated because when there's such a shiny object like Western Sydney, you know, all the birds are trying to flock in and try and get a piece of it because it is such a big opportunity. So we are looking at ways of creating, for example, a development entity that would be used to help with the planning and the zoning. And even with the zoning, it's down to all the way down to the level of operating hours of the businesses that are within the precinct. Because if we want that live, play, work environment, if we have, you know, we need to have gyms that are open 24-7. We need to have restaurants and bars and things like that that can meet the needs of, you know, the people that we're trying to attract so that they do want to work in that precinct. They're not, they're not bound by very tight zoning or, you know, curfew laws and things like that. So we're just going to make sure that there is an entity that can drive a very well thought out master plan because I don't know if people realize but this is a, the, the first plan's only arriving in 2026 and then we're only reaching it's probably where we need to be by 2040, 2050. So um, we need to make sure that we plan for the long term. And I, I also think one of the risks is that things move so quickly in technology. So you know, you plan for a precinct now, but who knows in 5, 10, 15 years, we may not need to have car parks. We may not, not need to have the things that we might be planning for in terms of the, the airport itself or even the developments for how people live. It may be totally different in 15, 20 years. So I think that's also the challenge is you know, are we thinking about what type of energy we will need? Are we thinking about the type of you know, IT infrastructure that we will need? Are we thinking about whether or not we will actually even have cars or will we have autonomous vehicles by then that will come and drop you off and go away? So whatever decisions we make, I think it's not as simple to take the traditional model and things change so quickly. So from a government perspective, we're going to create the Western Sydney Investment Attraction Office to help with the investment in attraction and promotion activity. I think the government are now looking at creating a development entity that will work hand in hand with the Western Sydney Airport Corporation. So these are the things that we're working on at the moment. Um, and within my division, I've established um, Defence New South Wales, which is an entity that helps defence industries and defence, and we're basing them in Parramatta. Uh, we've got a sector team also that's based in Parramatta. So we're building up the expertise and the resources that we need to make this real. Yeah, we'd be happy to nominate ourselves as the master developer. <laughs> but just to uh, add that point, Duncan, um, the, I think adding to the, the government piece is the utilities uh, for those of us in the game. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge and we understand that the utilities um, authorities are, I suppose, uh, they're, they're a tough, tough gig to deal with as well. Um, so we obviously try to work as collaboratively, collaboratively as possible. Uh, but that's definitely, we feel, would be a huge inroad to our ability to have a, yeah, a more unified approach there. Uh, I think, um, as I say, uh, further that is, is recognising that, um, you know, the ideal around, you know, will we be, will we be you know, flying our car to work and all that kind of jazz, uh, you know, how far ahead do we look? Uh, and, and are we trying to bite off more than we can chew by trying to solve for everything today um, is, is another way of looking at it uh, to make sure that what we do do is resilient, uh, it's scalable, and ultimately it absolutely suits the needs of, of what we know we can do uh, in the time being. Um, yeah, I was going to say, so and on the one hand, uh, we need flexibility for the region, the Aerotropolis, to develop. 
uh, over time. On the other hand, if you just, you have to put, in effect, pencil on paper eventually and say, there will be roads here, we will preserve open space. You know, we, through guidelines or through zoning, you know, these are the carbon objectives, zero carbon objectives, et cetera, et cetera. So that um, comes back a little bit to me to what do you call it, zoning or guidelines. I mean, there needs to be some coordination, but also at the same time the flexibility to move in another direction if needed because of changing technologies. Yeah, I think I've used an example of we, we're doing some projects in Austral for, at the moment near the Leppington Station and I sort of reflect that um, yeah, in 20 years time we'll be back again to, to turn that into a higher density project just by looking at the, the middle right. the, yeah, the middle of Sydney as, the, as an example. So I think that yeah, naturally that'll happen and then maybe another analogy is we think about you know, traffic corridors where there'll be you know, obviously space for you know, road winding over time and maybe a, a busway as well. Um, fast forward 50 years, maybe we'll be contracting that space again and giving it back to, to be free and open space because there won't be that many cars on the road. Exactly. Um, so I think it's that, that it will naturally evolve and be flexible. We'll all be riding bikes again. Yeah. As long as we're using recycling materials, <laughs> recycling materials along the way. <coughs> Eric, do you want to comment on that? I, sure, uh, in regards to master developer yeah. uh, and working uh, for moving forward, I think when you're holding on to uh, 6,000 hectares of leasable space uh, that you, you need to work uh, and keep that option open for a master developer. In the case of one of our transit uh, stations where we actually financed and we own about 25 hectares adjacent to the station, we see that as be beachfront property. We have another 200 uh, hectares um, uh, adjacent to that that's a private developer. So we actually work together with that developer to create a special taxation district which issued the bonds which built all of the infrastructure to connect to the uh, to the roadway system um, wet wet dry utilities uh, through this special district uh, through that that I mentioned earlier that uh, Panasonic eco solutions company came in as the, the, the anchor tenant on that site and we were able to, as part of the incentives and working with Panasonic to bring them over and with the private developer, what we decided to do with that first station nearest to the, uh, the airport, working with the master developer, was to create Colorado's first smart grid. So uh, um, it's a smart energy grid. So basically all of the energy that um, is generated through the, the solar panels, uh, we have a parking uh, facility there with uh, 800 lots and they're all covered with solar panels. Uh, Panasonic has their own panels in their installation plus uh, battery storage and all the excess power uh, gets sold back uh, into the grid and if there's ever any sort of issue uh, with uh, power, uh, that site could survive on that battery power for uh, uh, longer than three days. So that's now become an incentive for other technology companies that need that redundant uh, energy supply to come. It's testing out a technology and it's been a, a really interesting public-private uh, relationship. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we are testing autonomous uh, via, uh, buses uh, within that facility and uh, are even running them publicly now from the train station and it's only about 200, 300 feet, uh, 300 meters uh, to, to Panasonic's facility, but uh, just really trying to uh, make this an innovation lab. Uh, the LED lights that we're using there, we're testing them on the site. So there's street lights that have motion sensors and when you walk by, it, it brightens up and then it dims. So it makes the community safer and it also saves on energy. Uh, there's a super Wi-Fi technology, super parking meter. So we're testing it on this almost greenfield site since um, it's not uh, fully developed yet. Um, and then seeing how uh, that technology can be used in the future on airport. So um, that's just one of the ways we've been creative in working with both the tenant and the master developer to create something a little bit different uh, to help uh, incentivize companies to come. Earlier you mentioned that the rail line to the airport, mm -hmm. to Denver, uh, came late. Mm -hmm. And we understand that that was a private consortium that you, built it. Could you yeah. just quickly touch on that? Yeah, That's so a, it's a consortium between uh, Den Denver Transit Partners, uh, our regional transit district, 
the city also uh, provided some funding and the airport provided funding by building three of the stations on airport property. Um, through the Regional uh, uh, Transit uh, Authority, uh, there's some taxation dollars that get uh, involved throughout the state. But um, it really enabled a high-speed commuter train to the airport. It goes approximately 80 miles per hour, runs every 15 minutes, uh, has a capacity of about 300 passengers uh, per four, four car train set, and it runs every 15 minutes. So in an environment like Denver, um, having that um, redundancy uh, to get to the airport during blizzard and snow events, our employees can get access, uh, we can get passengers out through another alternative, um, in addition to just an employee amenity, um, it's been really helpful. Uh, I mentioned we have 35,000 employees, but if you just even look at our concessions program, we have a 2.2% uh, unemployment rate. So if you look at our 100 uh, concession locations, we're understaffed by over 400 to 500 people right now. So anything we can do to help the employees get to the airport uh, not only benefits the, uh, the airport, but uh, the concession operators and the entire community. Mm -hmm. uh, Duncan, I wanted to go back to the notion of industry uh, needing qualified workforce, et cetera. And I'm trying to remember if in this morning someone said uh, something about, uh, not exactly a brain drain, but uh, people leaving Sydney or leaving maybe this region. Um, I've worked on a science and technology park in Brunei. A lot of companies don't want to move to Brunei, but what they're trying to do is attract the educated Bruneians to come back, stay, and start their businesses. Um, is, that a, is there an issue like that here? Is so we, we've done a lot of industry consultations when we were coming up with the concept of will this aerospace and defense industry precinct work? So we met up with Boeing and Airbus and Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and all the big primes um, that are out there. And we were asking them about you know, their thoughts on the precinct, what, what would it take for them to establish themselves? And consistently, every single one that we spoke to, it was, will I be able to get the workforce that I need? It was about skills. Didn't matter what else we offered, if they didn't have the workforce that they needed, it wasn't, it wasn't a proposition that they would consider. So that is the number one priority, is to make sure that we've got the people that the big primes need with the right skills, and that there's also a great succession plan as well. That it's not just about the here and now, because we've had that in, other, if I take a defense example, like with the, when they're building the Collins uh, submarines, right, there was a real peak of activity. And then once that was completed, there was a bit of a trough. And I think we're also seeing that around the states now with the submarines being built in, in South Australia, is that a lot of the smart people are, are potential to shift to, to South Australia. And we don't want to have that, that brain drain between states. Because that's not good for the country as a whole. So for us, it definitely is around the skills development. And part of that is wanting to be a, an attractive proposition for young kids to think, wow, I've actually got a career in engineering. I've actually got a career in, in, in science and maths because if we don't start at, at, at a young level, we're not going to get the people going to universities or going to the TAFE or to the vet saying, oh, wow, I can actually be, I can work for a defense prime. I don't need to have a university degree because I think Ian was saying maybe 50, 60% are from universities, but the rest are from that, you know, from vet and TAFE, for example. So there's a big job that government has to play to make young kids, in particular girls, know that there's a pathway to very attractive and uh, you know, highly skilled type of jobs if they do their maths and they do the science. So they, do, they can be part of that, um, that ecosystem. And we had a, we called it Picture Parliament, which was a opportunity for young students that had either done their PhD or their masters or their honors. And they came into Parliament House in, um, in, in Sydney and we matched them up with big defense companies. Now, I don't think many young students at university knows what a Northrop Grumman does, or you know, Lockheed Martin, or any of the big defense primes. But when they had that opportunity to meet up with the key, like the, the, the GMs or with the HR manager, they realized this is an exciting industry. Like the defense industry, for example, it is high tech, it's creative, and it's creating the technologies of the future. And when I could see their eyes open and go, wow, I had no idea these companies can do the things that they can. So I think it's a whole end-to-end -end 
challenge that we have to address as a government. A is looking at how do we get young, young people and particularly girls interested in these types of jobs? How do we work with our TAFE and with the vet sector to make sure that they've got the right curriculums to be able to have the courses that the North Rucks need, for example? Working with the universities as well to make sure that they've got the right curriculums. And between all of that, we'll hopefully we'll get that right mix because any company will base themselves where the skills are and where do the skills stay? Well, they stay where they can live, work, and play. So that's part of the, the value proposition we have to get right through you know, this master plan as a developer, is this, let's get the live, work, play aspect right in Western Sydney. Let's make it have the, the heart and the blood life of, of any big major city like Sydney, make sure it's got a cultural center, make sure it has a you know, tourism aspect to it, make sure that it, we actually give it some life and soul, because if we don't, there's, there's no real, it, any levers to pull to make young people stay in that area, so that's why. Yeah, and, and so I, that's a good segue <laughs> to Dean, because um, you would be creating the environments that people want to live in, as well as work. Um, so in, in thinking about uh, what you do as a developer in the future, are you now thinking more mixed use? Are you thinking larger communities? Yep, uh, all of the above. Uh, I think it's interesting to reflect on sort of talking about you know, white collar jobs and potentially uh, what education pathways we go on to get there traditionally. Uh, our industry, we're in the development business, we're also in the construction industry and uh, whilst the development and construction industry represents you know, the largest industry uh, in Australia and as it does across pretty much all the developed world, it also represents the most underperforming industry from an efficiency perspective. So. We look at, um, not indirectly answering your question, not only what our product will be, but also how we go about creating that product. Uh, and it's really a real opportunity for us to actually think about in, you know, in 10 and 15 years time, as a builder, we'll actually be employing robotics engineers and, and software programmers to actually help us be able to construct the, the, the kind of housing product which will be sustainable and ultimately resilient to the changing needs of our customers in, in the future. Uh, talking about what kind of product it will be, as, as you mentioned, um, I think you know, we, sort of, we see that you know, density is something that we need to be able to do better in Sydney. Um, there's plenty of examples around the world where it's done really well uh, and um, that's something that as a business we're really focused on, um, doing quality density. Um, I was at a conference up in Queensland a couple of weeks ago and uh, it was a reflection on apartments and, and the, the focus on apartments either being built by maybe people who don't have families and definitely often built for people who don't have families and to think that um, our children's ability to play, um, pray, pray, play freely and, and openly near our own homes is, is sometimes diminished in, in the sort of the concrete jungles that, that are created. So I think there's some real opportunity there to really think about who, who our customer is and really put ourselves, maybe put ourselves out a little bit to, to, to challenge the brain of how we can be, be creative and, and give a, a, a quality product at the, at, um, at the end. Can I just add one thing that I think just, just triggered something as well? If you're a parent and you're looking at where you live, I mean, the most important decision is probably the school for your children. And I think that's also part of the challenge that we have here in Western Sydney, making sure we've got the right schools so that people want to live here. Because often, I know a lot of my friends choose where they live based on the schools that they can they get access to. So I think that's also a fundamental thing that we have to look at if we're looking at the skills with this. Let's make sure we have the right schools in Western Sydney for parents to want to be here rather than you know, either extending themselves and getting a bigger mortgage so they can be better to add a better school. So that's just one I wanted to add. Absolutely. I'd like to open the floor to questions. Hopefully there will be a few. Uh, there, I'm sorry, there's someone right behind you. Hi, my name is Matt Katsia, I'm from Oricon. We actually did the master plan for Ica Rolini. Um, one of the learning points out of that was um, that there are times when, for political reasons, a certain type of development gets built up, the, the momentum behind a type of development around an airport. So um, in, at, at Ica Rolini, one of the proposals was a very high-tech development area which in fact hasn't been implemented. And the reason it hasn't is because the nature of the skills and the nature of the community actually just didn't support it. Um, it goes to the point of having a really well through, through, thought through master plan and not doing stuff because it seems fashionable. And that's not a commentary on what we're proposing around, uh, around Western Sydney Airport, it's just a statement around pragmatism. Um, don't model the airport on Denver or on Incheon or on 
any other airport around the world, think about what this airport needs, what the community of this airport um, can offer, and build it around that as opposed to some ideal because because you probably won't succeed in the implementation part, which is where we all we'll and I think get to. Uh, many people today have said, I mean, this is a okay, overused word, unique <laughs> situation. Uh, so that's, I think, really excellent advice. And Nate Cherry says hello. <laughs> Another question. Yeah, Owen Hayford from PwC. Um, my question goes to this coordination issue. Um, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about the various things that need to come together. Um, uh, there's no one level of government, not even the federal government, that can coordinate and control all of this without the cooperation of the state government, without the cooperation of local government. Um, I heard reference this morning to a city deal, um, and you know I can see how uh, a deal between local, state, and federal government might help provide a governance sort of framework um, and help steer the coordination of these things. Um, but I wonder, you know, uh, who else perhaps needs to be party to this city deal? Um, big landowners, do they need to be party? Do the universities need to be party? Some of these key, key participants, How, you know, and, and where is this city deal at? Because it seems to me that to get this coordination piece Right, you need a, a framework for that. The steer we're getting from our political leaders is that'll be dealt with by way of a city deal, but beyond that statement, there has been very little information. Um, I'm wondering if you could, if anyone on the panel has yeah, I'll, uh, information I'll, I'll to share. I'll give context on that. So, um, with the city deals, I think there's been two that have been done before. One, one was in Townsville, and the other one was in, in Tasmania. And there's a lot of work that's going on behind the scenes to get to the level that we need to be in terms of the agreement between the federal government, the states, and the local councils. I think with the Western Sydney, the importance that it has on the whole country gives it a lot more impetus for the federal government to be working very closely with the state government and with local councils. So Jeff Roberts will be talking later. And he's been really work working with Lucy Turnbull and then obviously with the Department of Premier Cabinet. They're working very hard to make sure that they are talking to the right people that they are talking with the landowners, that they're talking with the, the local councils. I think the eight councils that are involved in the city deal, uh, that they're talking with their federal counterparts. So today, Brendan McGrandall's here as well. So I, I think we all aligned on, on what we need to do and how we need to do it. The city deal, it is very complicated because we're all putting in proposals on key activities that we'd like to see as part of it. So we, for example, the aerospace and defense precinct is one of those things that we're putting on the table to say, all right guys, this is too important for us not to do. We need to make sure we get agreement on all three levels. And we have to be in agreement that we all believe and will support it and also be accountable for its delivery. So I think that's something that's working, um, and people are working very hard on it. And there's multiple different types of proposals that are going into it, from skills development to um, angry precincts, you name it, small business. There's a lot of work that's happening. And Jeff Roberts and the team have been working tirelessly on it. The plan was was hopefully early next year to get the city deal signed, but it's really in the federal government's hands at the moment. But these are questions that I would ask Jeff Roberts later, but I can assure you that everyone's intention is to make sure that we get an outcome that A, leverages what the Greater City Commission have done with the, the reports that have been released in terms of the three city model. Um, they'll be having some district plans as well that'll come out. So I think all the bits have been moving quite quickly and also there's been a lot of effort into it. But if we don't get the local communities buy if we don't get the local councils buy if we don't get industries buy if we don't get state government buy and the Commonwealth, it's not going to work. But all the things that I see is that everyone's very much aligned to get this done. I think everyone's aligned to make sure that it's coordinated and that we make sure that there will be a time where there will be wider engagement regarding what the city deal is and what it means. So the Aerotropolis Summit that the Premier talked about, that's going to be an avenue. This forum is an avenue. And I think we need to talk more with those private landowners. We need to talk more with local communities. But we're just trying to get everything together so we can get that city deal completed. But when you speak to Jeff Roberts, I think he's at 3 o'clock. I think that question is the one that's leading it. But what I'm seeing, everything's indicating that it's, it's very positive.
Question in the back. Yeah. Just thanks very much, Stephen Harmer from Lendlease Engineering. We've seen with recent developments like White Bay, where you've had uh, foundation tenants demanding high quality public transport. I just wonder if the window for transport um, corridor preservation is actually closing with the infill developments around the airport. Okay, that's, um, so I, I know that this is a real uh, area of focus for, for the government. I think if, and this is just my view, but historically if we preserved those, co those corridors many years ago, we wouldn't have the cost that we have now associated with actually the developments of it. It's something that uh, Minister Reyes is very focused on in terms of making sure that we do get the right connectivity and that we look at how do we actually preserve those corridors for the future. And I think that's the bit as well that's that most of the politicians are spending their time on is around those transport corridors, because uh, that's fundamental to, to the success of the whole, the whole Western West City, City deal will be in the transport. Right. Eric, did you wanna? Well, come um, in our situation, uh, we secured uh, uh, the, the rail line, six stations, uh, really 37 kilometers uh, after okay. the airport was built. So we had to go through very public and painful eminent domain process. So as we look to Western Sydney and how, how this train line is resolved, uh, I would not look to Denver uh, as an example. Uh, it's uh, a lot harder to take away that property and the land afterwards, especially with uh, the tremendous growth uh, in real estate prices and, and, and the, our city has seen partially from, from the result of the airport. So uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a vicious circle. Another question? Okay. Uh, Bob, Bob Germain, Regional Development Australia, Sydney. Um, one of the things that we do have in Sydney is a lot of uh, industry clusters um, which are operating and each of those clusters have a competitive advantage and uh, we've identified several of them who will have an opportunity to, to develop around an airport. But at the moment they're not developed around the airport, they're in other parts of Sydney. Um, I think the question is to Duncan that whilst we've got a Western Sydney deal, right, and we have focused attention with governments, um, there hasn't been engagement with those clusters as to how they can fit around those economic opportunities. And I suppose my question is how and in what way can the government um, help uh, get that incredible industry focus and uh, experience as to how and in what way they will come and invest away from where they are within Sydney, but use that competitive advantage for the opportunities around the airport? Uh, it, I think part of your question raises a potential issue or concern that we have to be mindful of, is that we don't take away industry from existing areas and we bring them to Western Sydney, right? Because then you know, there's, there's no net gain because we're just moving and uplifting businesses from one part of you know, Sydney or New South Wales into Western Sydney area. We're really focused on new types of business lines or opportunities for businesses that might have outgrown the, the existing footprint, for example. So like for Northrop Grumman, I really have to praise their vision and leadership, and in particular Ian, for saying and committing to a concept, right? Because there's nothing out there at the moment. And that was from you know, that deep engagement that we had with Northrop, and, and again, their vision, and they could, they could see the commitment both from the three levels of government that were involved in pulling the deal together. We have to make sure that we support industry and industry clusters that are around Western Sydney, but Richmond and, and you name it, all around um, New South Wales. And we've started a process of mapping those capabilities because if we don't understand where they are, it's hard for us then also to reach into them. We need to make sure that through these types of forums and also through my team that we can inform them on what the opportunities are. And at the moment, it has been very concept level that we know we're going to build a precinct, we know it's going to have these attributes. Once the city deal is signed, then it becomes something real. And that's when we have to activate what we do in terms of the promotion to local industries and let them know and understand what that precinct will represent and how they fit into it. Because as I mentioned earlier, we want to make sure that we focus on competitive advantages and, and make sure that we've got our niche rather than just being all things to everyone. And we had a, a great meeting with uh, Boeing the other day that said, well, what are you guys? Are you just a... Are you a Costco? Are you just a supermarket? Are you what? What do you stand for? And what do you represent for the global market? And that's something that we need to make sure the precinct represents, that it has something that's unique and special about it. 
and that we do reach out to industry and let them know how they can benefit from this. Because we're not just supporting Western Sydney industries, we need to support all industries in New South Wales. And you'll see now with the way the industry works, it's no longer you're just a company, you have to collaborate with other companies and share ideas and share expertise. So we're very mindful of that, Bob, that we don't just focus on one area and forget about the rest. <clears throat> David Chandler, a construction management at uh, Western Sydney University. Uh, construction really hasn't been um, on, on anyone's tongues today as being one of the exciting future industries, but uh, uh, Western Sydney economy will be the third largest construction economy in Australia for the next 20 years. Uh, the airport's just going to be probably 20%, maybe 25% of that construction economy, and there's not really much thought about the scale of what's going on. We know it's a pretty unsophisticated and inefficient industry. Arguably, our industry costs 20% to 30% more than it should. We're amongst the most expensive construction economies in the world. So when we talk about, well, gee, could we save a billion dollars on a $5 billion airport spend and put it to the rail? Um, that really opens up another question as to how are we going to build a smart, efficient, long-lasting construction economy in Western Sydney that's actually going to transfer uh, an economy with 70% of businesses being SMEs, 50% of those businesses are construction related. How are we going to transition those companies to be the smart modern construction companies of the future? Uh, we're going to graduate 1,500 uh, construction graduates at the school uh, between now and 2025. And what I'm interested in is what sort of future legacy are all these projects going to leave so we've got a robust modern construction industry that's going to go well beyond 20 years at the end of all of this. Yep, uh, thanks Dave. Um, I can't speak on behalf of the entire industry. Uh, from our perspective, uh, we're very focused on, as I mentioned earlier, what, uh, what our processes looks like. And I think uh, to collaborate with those who are interested in, in pushing the bar higher, uh, from a regulation perspective, I was uh, you know, thinking about it. For us to complete a, a $500,000 project in Western Australia requires about 10 times the amount of licensing and, and I suppose, commitment um, than it does to take a, undertake a $100 million project here in New South Wales. So it, there's, there's multiple elements from a regulation perspective about maybe driving out the cowboys in our industry would be the start to, to raise the bar on quality and put that, that, that longevity into, the, into our projects. Uh, I think it also has to come from within, um, which is what we're focused on. And, and the challenge of our industry is whilst we underperform, as you just reflected on some numbers, um, the businesses are still profitable doing that. So the disruption is going to come from somewhere. Um, we'll be disrupting ourselves in a, in a bid to remain relevant, but I'm sure there'll be some significant players coming from other, other markets who see the Australian market as a pretty soft market, which is, which is right for the, for the taking. Again, that's just my perspective. Um, yeah. I've been told we need to conclude. so. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> no more questions. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask you to join me in thanking the panelists for their. <laughs>